Hello everyone and a warm welcome to the Directions Live online webinar series by Ezri Malaysia. My name is Ami Faisal and I am your host for today's session. Now, just a quick reminder before we get started that we are recording today's session and it will be available via Esri Malaysia events page later this week. So if you want to rewatch it, you have that available to you. So introducing today's presenter is Mat Afif Abu Bakar, our industry consultant with the enterprise consulting team of Esri Malaysia, who will be leading the webinar today. So without any further ado, I shall pass the presentation to Afif. Over to you, Afif. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Ahmed. Uh, so thank you everyone for your, uh, for, your, for your interest in the topic of GeoAI. So basically today I will actually explain to you uh, the core fundamental concepts of GeoAI and also I will actually emphasize on how you can actually optimize your operational efficiency within your organizations using uh, GeoAI. And lastly, I will actually demonstrate some of uh, our recent works on GeoAI using the ArcGIS platform. So the first question is why GeoAI? Why uh, why do you show? Uh, why are we are keen to uh, actually know on what is actually GeoAI and how actually this thing can contribute to our existing workflows? So basically, what that uh, what that attract people to actually want to learn on GeoAI is basically because of these kinds of results. So this is an example of Kuwait uh, Public Authority of Civil Information on how they actually extract these building footprints and also streets automatically, uh, whereby before this, they need to actually have 119 days of manual entry jobs to actually uh, digitize and do a data entry jobs for these particular uh, polygons. But now, they can actually do all of this using GeoAI within one and a half hours of processing and also two days of QC jobs. So basically that is 60 times faster than their, uh, than their previous conventional way of doing things. So this is how you can actually leverage the use of your machines in which we also give uh, offers flexibilities in terms of scalability of GeoAI where you can actually park your, your uh, models inside, uh, for example, inside cloud system, inside RGS Online, for example, to actually uh, optimize the use of these uh, machine learning and also training processes. This is another example that I will actually show here today in terms of how you want to actually produce a classified uh, wires and poles from a LIDAR, uh, from an unclassified LIDAR point clouds in which Previously, this has been done for about 50,000 man hours per year of manual labeling and how we can actually automate these processes. Okay, so if your main, your primary concern is in terms of the accuracy of the GeoAI capabilities. So over here, we have uh, a statistic by ImageNet Visual Recognition Challenge Error Rate. So as you can see here in the purple colored one is the machine learning capabilities and the blue colored uh, bar is basically uh, representing the deep learning. So since uh, 2010 and 2011, there's, there has been an uh, uh, argument in which machine learning is uh, producing a lot of errors. So a lot of QAQC uh, job needs to be done on this uh, train model and also the inference uh, results. But now, since uh, we have progressed in terms of deep learning, and since 2015, basically uh, deep learning has surpassed the human error rate in terms of uh, from 5% of human error rates and now it, it, it keep on uh, decreasing up to 2.3% and uh, that is basically on 2017 which is I believe we have now we have a capable model to actually produce a much accurate uh, result in nowadays situations. So what we can actually conclude from here is that computer vision is now almost as good if not better than the human vision. Okay, first, before we move forwards into, uh, into more technicalities, uh, basically you can actually uh, see all of these words if you were, if you were talking about uh, GeoAI in terms of random forest algorithms, in terms of cognitive computing, TensorFlow frameworks, but all of this is quite intimidating if you are new to the field. So what we are uh, like to highlight here today is that there is actually these three main concepts uh, that falls within the GeoAI. The first one is the artificial intelligence in which 
uh, is the uh, is the machine or computer ability to actually exhibit uh, human uh, human capabilities of decision making processes. And within this artificial intelligence, basically you have machine learning, whereby it is a data uh, driven approach where you give a certain inputs and also you you decide on the parameterizations on on training the models. So most of the parameterization process and inputs are being connected by human. And now we are moving towards deep learning, whereby you provide the machines with a certain inputs, and the, uh, and the deep learning actually learn through uh, artificial neural networks, and it comes up with its own parameter to do its own decision making. So what I can say here is that basically uh, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, and deep learning is a deeper concept of machine learning. So we are here we at Esri, we are not focusing AI is one product. So basically, we are working hard on actually embedding most of the GUI capabilities within our RGIS platform. As you can see here, we have actually tons of examples in which you can try on in RGIS API for Python. We have actually developing lots of uh, scriptings to actually incorporate uh, deep learning models into uh, RGIS platform. We also have a developed uh, ArcGIS notebook within ArcGIS Pro, which is a resemblance of Jupyter notebooks. In case you are, uh, if you're keen on the uh, code and programming uh, and offers flexibilities of your processing. And we also are moving toward a scalable GeoAI capabilities within the ArcGIS Online and also in the ArcGIS Enterprise, where you can actually optimize the processing times. And then, uh, not to forget our field teams, basically we are developing a few uh, research and development on quick capture and also survey one to three. For example, in the survey one to three, we are now cu uh, currently uh, testing on embedding the TensorFlow framework within the survey one to three. So after this, maybe your field teams can already uh, took some automations of uh, image capture within survey one to three as a part of the GeoAI process. Okay, so how actually we, un we can unfold the GeoAI capability within the ArcGIS technology? We have been doing uh, most of this uh, GeoAI for almost a decade, I think. Uh, in terms of classification, we are familiarized with classification, we are familiarized with the clustering process, and we have familiarized with the prediction process, for example, the error interpolations. And now we are moving toward the deep learning workflow. So the three main patterns for GeoAI is basically we want to actually do an object detection. We want to actually detect object from imagery or full motion video, for example. And then we want to actually do a prediction. Uh, for example, if you have a complete hydraulic modeling, you want to actually model where is the area that has uh, prone to water leakage or breakage of pipeline systems. And the third one is the pattern detection. For example, in the case of uh, COVID-19, you want to actually detect the clusters of, uh, of the disease outbreaks within a certain area. So this is how we can actually leverage the use of GeoAI within the ArcGIS platform. I would like to emphasize the ArcGIS imagery AI workflow. So over here, we start with the image management. We can actually handle a lot of imageries and we have a lot of capabilities within the ArcGIS Pro to actually conduct this image management process. So uh, from here, we have actually developed a, a, a deep learning modules under the image analyst uh, extension to actually, uh, to actually enable you to do most of the GeoAI workflows within the ArcGIS Pro since the release of ArcGIS Pro 2.5. So you don't have to actually go out into the framework to actually embed all of this workflow. So we have simplified the methods into so within the ArcGIS Pro. And we basically, the first step is we do labeling. We want to actually teach the machine what are the object of interest that we would like to identify, that we would like to detect. And then from the labeling part, we will actually conduct a data preparation phase where, whereby we actually uh, uh, produce an image chips. We call it as image chips to be as an input of, uh, to train our model. So basically, we have our trained deep learning models over here as a geoprocessing tools that you can actually uh, uh, you can actually call back your image chips, and then we will actually do 
a trained deep learning model. And then once we have actually trained that model, we will actually apply that model back to a, maybe to a larger extent or to a different image, image through an, this inferencing process. So from here, once you have detected your objects, you want to actually apply other informations to incorporate with your detected object. For example, you have, uh, de uh, you have detected a, a building footprints and you want to actually classify whether it is damaged, uh, it is a damaged building or damaged structures from a, from a hurricane or something like that. You can actually uh, embed other information on the detected object to conduct further analysis. And lastly, since you have all of these uh, detected objects and information embedded uh, automatically on your object of interest, you can actually apply this thing back uh, as a part of field mobility, where you can actually mobilize your field team to do a QC jobs on the field, or you want to actually uh, put this as a statistics, uh, as a monitoring to your management uh, in the form of dashboard, we can actually leverage the use of RTS dashboard on that. So basically, the whole uh, GeoAI is, uh, uh, is emphasizing that ArcGIS is being used for each step of the deep learning workflow. So you can actually do all of these steps within ArcGIS Pro now. So these are some of the initiatives on how we can actually explore the endless possibilities of deep learning. So basically, uh, we at ESRI, we are, uh, we are working on uh, developing uh, the tools for you to actually utilize on how you can actually conduct this object detection. So you can actually come up with your own needs so we can actually work on some things. For example, like this, you have extracted a certain building footprints and then you want to embed information of the structures. Or let's say, for example, here we have also a catfish study whereby they fly a full motion, they, they fly a drone and they, uh, they gather a full motion video from, from a drone video. And then from there, they actually extract uh, all those catfish automatically, and then embedded it, uh, embedded it uh, on the uh, on the monitoring uh, platform such as the RTS dashboard. Okay, like I've mentioned earlier on how we can actually optimize the use of GeoAI to uh, to actually optimize your operational efficiencies. This is an example of wires and poles from airborne lidar data. So these are normally being conducted by the LiDAR operator. The one that I've shown earlier, how you can, uh, how this thing has been, uh, the workflow has, uh, is, will take about 50,000 man hours per year of manual labeling. Manual labeling. And the, the, the challenges is that 99% uh, of points are from other classes. So most of these are being done manually through human interpretation. So it is a tedious process where you need to actually manually identify all of its wires and poles and steel wires. So uh, it, it is mostly prone to errors and also it takes a lot of time. So you can see here that wires easily blend into three canopies and building. So that will, will actually uh, harden the, the process of extracting all of these wires and poles. But there are some good news too. Intensity and the numbers of returns on the wire points often different than on uh, than, than their surrounding. For example, here you can see uh, on the right side of this of this image, you can see that wires and uh, are differentiated from the background imageries through their intensity. And this is how we can actually train the machine to identify all of these wires and poles uh, in which differentiated from their surrounding. For example, and overlapping between trees and also wires, we can also differentiate that using a GeoAI. This is a, uh, an example of a prediction. These are actually uh, generated by GeoAI capabilities. So you can see here that we can, uh, that the machine extracted the poles and wires uh, and producing quite a good result from here. So we want to actually do a comparison with the manual entry jobs. So over here, you can see a few examples. We can see on the on the left side here, this is a ground truth, uh, the one that actually manually extracted and the one that actually uh, predicted from the machine learning. Basically, most of the, most of the results shows a very good uh, classifications of, uh, of these wires, poles, and also stay wires. And almost the same result, basically. We, we can actually, actually see some misclassifications over here, but that is 
very minor, I think, in terms of uh, in terms of efficiency that we'll get from the geo AI capabilities. So from here, there are some uh, of misclassified objects. Not uh, the machine is not perfect, but be uh, before this, you need to actually do all the manual uh, interpretation, and most of the time, have been taken on the interpretation process. But now you can actually leverage. Uh, your main powers to actually focus on the QA, QC jobs rather than focusing on the on the extraction process. So all of this from unclassified points to a classified predicted uh, point clouds and uh, to the end result of the classified point clouds, normally uh, what we have been reported is that this takes about 20 hours rather than 50,000 uh, 50, uh, 50, hours a year, you can actually uh, you can actually optimize the operation up to twenty hours only, but that's depend on the capabilities of your machine to handle this kind of heavy processing. But that's a huge amount of differences from the manual uh, manual extraction process and also the one that being extracted automatically. So now I would like to actually move on to the demonstration part whereby I would like to showcase the use of various geoprocessing tools in ArcGIS Pro to detect vehicle mass from imagery based map. So basically over here, we explore implementing a workflow to supplement a 3D scenes with additional vehicle information using the power of deep learning. So over here, we have multiple steps. So we begin by detect the locations of vehicle, then classify them as sedan, as SUV vehicle, van, pickup or truck. And finally, we will add some extra information like colors and orientations of the car to actually produce a very good 3D model. So I will actually go through the steps here. As I've mentioned uh, earlier that we need to do a data uh, imagery management part. So over here, we actually in the labeling process. So you see here, I've done the labeling for the vehicle mass. So this one are being done manually uh, through digitizing processes. So I digitized most of the vehicles. This is the first hierarchy of the classification. And then I actually incorporate information such as the front base of the vehicle to actually determine the orientations of the car. So here we can actually see that we've digitized the front base of the car. That's it. This is a, a subclass within the vehicle hierarchy. And then from here, we actually classify the types of the vehicle, whether it is a pickup, SUV, sedan, truck, or van. So you can see here, basically, we've classified this as pickup, and then this one as sedan, and another one as SUV. Yeah, so these are being done manually for us to actually incorporate. Uh, into the training process. So over here we have under image analyst two, we have a deep learning module and we want to actually export this training sample data that we've digitized manually as an image chips. So here we uh, we have actually uh, simplified the process of exporting the image chips within the RGS Pro so you can actually uh, determine all the parameters over here. And then when you've done with the parameterizations of the image chips, we can actually run it and we'll produce an image chip that will become an input for the deep learning process. So you see, you can see here, this is the example of the image chip that, I, that I've mentioned earlier. This is basically an input that we like to uh, pump into our trained deep learning process. Okay. So I will actually demonstrate uh, Basically, what I'd like to show here is an ArcGIS notebook. This is a resemblance of the Jupyter notebook, but uh, don't worry. You can actually um, you can actually use a model builder, for example, if you are familiar with a codeless uh, code based uh, processing. Uh, you can use model builder, or you can actually leverage the use of existing um, geo processing tools. Okay. I just would like to actually, uh, for those who, who might miss the as a user conference, this is an example of, uh, of models that you can basically run within the GeoAI platform. Using the RGS API for Python, basically you have this 
this list of models that you can actually run within the LGS API for Python. But don't worry if you are uh, if you are familiar with the uh, with the geoprocessing tools. Basically, you want to actually uh, use the current existing model that appears here. We have actually embedded these six models out of these 15 models into the geoprocessing tools. If you want to have a more flexibility in terms of processing, you can opt for, for LGS notebook. But if you if you want a simpler way of doing this deep learning, you can actually use these trained deep learning models within LGS uh, Pro. So we give the option. So over here, uh, since we have prepared the data in terms of image chips, and now we want to actually run this mass RCNN data. Uh, this mass RCNN model. So this is basically the uh, 15 iterations of my uh, train, uh, training data sets. And now we can actually see that when we run that process, either using uh, RGS notebook or using the geoprocessing tool, we can see here the detected objects that, uh, that have been detected. So this is basically the vehicles that have been detected. These are detected uh, automatically using the using the uh, deep learning model, and then the vehicle front, and then the color of the vehicle. So these are the uh, the information that have been produced and detected automatically from the GOM model. And now the the question is that how we want to actually uh, incorporate this information to become a more uh, realistic models of the car. So we have actually incorporated uh, the use of AppPy. Uh, also, also this one I've been conducted using Argis Notebook, but you can actually opt for model builder and also geoprocessing tools. So the, uh, basically the end result from this uh, post-processing process, we want to actually come up with points of this uh, individual cars that represent the uh, the, the vehicle itself, the location of the vehicle, the, the front side, the front base of the vehicle, and also the colors of the vehicle. So from here, basically the, the final output is something like this. These are the 3D models that have been incorporated with the information that we've extracted, extracted from the GeoAI. So you can see from the symbology part, Over here, we have okay. We have actually incorporated this uh, information such as color of the car, the depth which represent the length of the car, and also the orientations of the car. So from here, we apply back to this custom symbology to actually uh, to actually show this information in 3D model, in which resemble the exact uh, actual model of Audi X6, for example, the BMW 3 Series. So let's not stop over here. We want to actually uh, share this information uh, to the people. We can actually leverage the use of web 3D scene. So over here, this is a web 3D scenes of these 3D models. So from this uh, information that you have detected, uh, this uh, detected, you can actually transfer this information. For example, you are a business owner. You want to expand your uh, parking lots, for example, for your shopping complex. And now you want to actually uh, quantify how many cars that uh, that happen to to uh, to enter your shopping lots within uh, this specific amount of time. So you will have a multi-temple analysis over here for you to actually decide how uh, how you can actually expand the parking lot size, for example. Or you want to actually monitor car activities during this uh, this COVID-19 uh, recovery movement control uh, order, for example. So. This is the final output of this uh, 3D vehicle that you can actually uh, explore on other things for your management to decide. Okay, the next example, the next demonstration that I would like to show here is uh, one uh, one demonstration that I've conducted along the Kasas Highway in Malaysia. Basically, I uh, uses a GoPro video and I've taken this video footage uh, along the Kasas Highway. The context that I would like to highlight here is that. Since uh, here in Malaysia, we are in the in the midst of a uh, recovery movement control order from the COVID-19. So the car activities on the road is basically an important indicator of our economic activities and also uh, in terms of uh, activities that are running on the road that need to be monitored by the by the authority, for example, police force. So all of these informations are meaningless 
if you just put it on a video footage like this. So how we can actually transfer this information into a meaningful uh, geo, uh, geo, geo tech information. So from here, basically, I've conducted the same workflow as what I've been shown in ArcGIS Pro, but now I'm implementing a tensor flow framework that actually conducts all these processes. So the same procedure where we actually do the image management and we actually prepare the test, uh, test and train the test sets. And from here, you can actually see that I've actually extracted uh, different frames uh, from, the, from the video, from the GoPro video. And from these frames, basically we want to actually label on, the object, uh, on our object of interest. For example, here that I'm interested with the car activities on the road. So we use this label image tools to actually label our object of interest. For example, here we have traffic light, we have road signs, we have street lights and vehicle. So from uh, from this uh, label, we will we will actually uh, we will actually translate into the uh, translate it into this XML file, and then we translate into a CSV file. For example, over here you can actually see that. For every classes that we have actually uh, labeled inside the label image, it is embedded with the frames. So this is how we want to actually uh, give an input to the to the machine that within that specific frames, what is the or object of interest. And over here, you can see that I've run this uh, TensorFlow framework for about uh, sixty thousand iterations, and we uh, and we are quite satisfied with the results and how we can actually. Uh, use this information and then trans, uh, transfer it back and, and then do the inferencing back on the GoPro video because uh, we want to actually see uh, this object detection results over this video. So you can see here, we have actually detected a quite, uh, quite a good results over here in terms of road signs, in terms of vehicle, in terms of street lights, and all of these are being done automatically. So the manual process are being done on the labeling side. So you can actually apply all these things back automatically on the videos that you are interested in. This is an example of how we utilize ArcGIS uh, dashboard to actually monitor the detected vehicles along the Kassas Highway, the detected road signs, and the detected street lights, for example, here. So this is a stretch of frames for example, you see, you can see the blinking. Uh, signal uh, that actually uh, that actually show the locations of the frames. So over here we have 145 detected vehicles, and we on the left side we have the confidence level of our detections. So this confidence level actually resemble the accuracy of the detection that are being presented by the machine. So let's say we have the 67 confidence uh, of detected. Uh, Detected, uh, uh, detected road signs, okay? So you can see here, even though it is a 67% confidence, but it still managed to actually detect an actual road sign. So even though it is uh, low in the confidence level, but uh, with a good result, basically you can actually get a good uh, object detection over here. So let's see another example. We can actually go through the uh, the whole stretch of Kasas Highway to actually identify the numbers of detected vehicle within a different stretch, uh, within the different extents of Kasas Highway. So we can actually come up with a with a conclusion that which are the area that we we need to focus on uh, to actually monitor the road activities. So from every feature class over here, you can actually see a few sets of feature class. Uh, for every point that actually resembles the detected vehicle, detected road signs, and detected street light. For example, here we can actually see the that we can actually visually see four road signs are being detected on the images, and we can actually go to the road sign. Basically, there are four detected road signs. So this is how you can actually automate the extraction process into the dashboard. So without uh, any manual entry jobs involved in the process of this. Uh, rather than a QAQC process. So you just need to focus on the QAQC rather than the extraction process. So that will actually optimize most of your operational efficiencies. So this is how you can actually use uh, deep learning. Uh, another, another example, which I've been working on, on the uh, place of interest identification. So over here we have, 
let's say you have a 360 cameras and basically previously you need to actually uh, geotag every single features on the 360 cameras and now you can actually leverage the use of these GeoAI capabilities and you can actually achieve a very good uh, accuracy of object detection for your POI. Yeah, for your POI. For example, over here, we can actually see uh, uh, Maybank are being detected with high accuracy. And we can actually translate this information as a, uh, as a, as a geotech information into your uh, ArcGIS dashboard, for example. So the key takeaways from my presentation, basically, I want to highlight that GeoAI is not just one product. Basically, it's spanned across the ArcGIS platform. And uh, the potential of these GeoAI capabilities in replacing your manual and tedious time-consuming tasks to boost your organization efficiency. And the third one is how you can actually understand AI, machine learning, and deep learning, and how it can actually benefit stakeholders in the decision-making process. So I hope uh, I've given enough information for today's. Basically, I will pass the floor to Ahmed for the Q&A session. Okay, thank you, Afif. That was a really interesting presentation on the possibilities through GeoAI. So we've had a couple of questions come through. And uh, to just kick off, we have one from Nick Shamsul. Uh, what is the difference between object detected from deep learning and object detected from image segmentation? Go to you, Afif. Okay, basically, as I've mentioned in the earliest slide, uh, I've, uh, uh, I've explained on the on the difference between image uh, in terms of machine learnings and also in terms of deep learning. Basically, image segmentation is a is a subset of machine learning. So what we do with uh, image segmentation normally we uh, we classify the image and then from there uh, we actually input a certain parameters to actually enhance the classification process. So we interfere with the with the training of the modeling process. But with deep learning, you just give the model certain inputs with a large sample of data sets and you run that model within a certain period of times and the model will actually learn by itself through its artificial neural network rather than our own uh, parameterization so the machine basically make the decision making process based on its own interpretations i hope uh, that's answer your question so i'll pass it back to Ahmed. okay thank you so let's move to the next question uh what is the minimum image for training? Okay, in terms of minimum image for training, basically uh, the one that I did for Maybank, uh, I did for about uh, 30, uh, 30 image for training and 10 for about test, for, for the test uh, image. So about 40 image for one uh, classify classification. But for example, if you want to actually uh, train a large number of uh, class, class. For example, you have six class. Uh, or let's say, for example, you have three class that like I've shown in the Kansas Highway. You have street lights, you have uh, uh, vehicles. So you need a larger num number of sample if you want to actually train it within the same model. So that for that one, basically, for the train, I use about uh, 227 for the train and 100 uh, for about 100 for the test. So you need a larger number of samples to improve the accuracy. So it depends on the models and your own objective. Yeah, I hope that's answer your question. All right, nice. So the next question is, uh, can you please tell me what is the data that was being used which you created the car models? So I think this means the 3D car that you uh, created. Okay. For that one, basically uh, the data is, uh, is a feature class uh, of that individual points of that cost that have been generated from uh, the object detected and also from the apply processing but the one that we use uh, actually we just apply a customized symbology on the cost that one is actually available if let's say you have uh, Malaysian models of cost and then you want to actually apply it back on that single points basically we can actually uh, apply that symbology on that individual point and appear in the in the scene so basically, that is not a data, but a symbology applied on the on the feature class, All right? Yeah, if I could add, so would that be the image that you use is from a drone? Oh, okay. For the image, basically, that is a satellite imagery that is available from ArcGIS, uh, from the Esri, uh, Esri, uh, Esri web, uh, sorry, Esri image services. So that is basically from the satellite imagery. 
Okay, thank you, Afif. So that's all the time we have today. So if we have not answered your question, we will surely reach out to you with a response. So just a little about what's coming up next on our webinar series. So on the 12th, we'll discover the advanced uh, location technologies and telecommunication solution offerings with a GIS platform that will help you stay ahead. So this webinar is uh, entitled Putting the Geospatial in 5G. And on the August of 19th, we shall learn on uh, how Arctis Hub allows you to package websites, initiative events, and web applications to engage your stakeholders and use enterprise sites to create custom tailored pages that supports uh, easy discovery of your maps, apps, and other content shared to an Arctis enterprise portal. So do keep a look out for this space, uh, azumnesia.com.my slash webinars for the upcoming events and webinars. So we really love your feedback. So take the time to fill out the brief survey that you will see pop up at the end of the session. Uh, further feedback or questions can be sent directly to events at esrimalaysia.com.my. And finally, if you would like to rewatch this webinar or share with your colleagues, the recording will be shortly available on Esri Malaysia events page. Once again, thank you, Afif, and thanks everyone for joining us, and we'll see you for the next Direction Live uh, webinar series. Goodbye.